from the heart of where innovation, money, and power collide. In Silicon Valley and beyond, this is Bloomberg Technology with Emily Chang. in New York in for Emily Chang. This is Bloomberg Technology coming up in the next hour. Didi sinks Thursday alongside Chinese stocks. But will a Chinese crackdown on tech giants backfire in the United States? We'll explore. Plus, tech star power in Sun Valley. Mark Zuckerberg, Jeff Bezos emerged from the shadows as part of the Allen & Company conference in Sun Valley. I have the latest. And content creators dole out trading advice. It's the new trend on TikTok and it's big business. We'll talk to one of the biggest influencers or finfluencers. She's known as Robin Hood Kid over on Twitter. It's Kayla Kilbride. Meanwhile, those stories in a moment. But first, U.S. stocks dropping the most in almost three weeks amid growing anxiety that, well, is it the spread of the COVID-19 variant that's going to upend growth expectations? Or is it just that we're starting to see that data rollover? Kriti Gupta is here with the markets and no place to hide in equities. Absolutely. Caroline, where did all that tech outperformance go? Well, let me tell you, it went all into treasuries, just driving that yield lower and lower. And even that wasn't enough to lift those tech stocks. Widespread selling in stocks, widespread selling in risk assets, that, say, that flight to safety trade very much active. And you can really see the SOX index took a massive brunt or the brunt of the hit, I should say, a massive hit, a gigantic hit, whatever you want to call it, really in that entire tech sphere down 1.2%. And that's really the sector I want to zoom in on because we are talking in about once again, the underperformance today, but this kind of been a pattern all week long, down nearly 3% on the week. That story from a few months ago that that chip shortage was helping those stocks, not the story anymore. People saying perhaps that trade is overplayed. And speaking of trades that may be overplayed, Caroline, remember when we saw those high beta names really thriving? Hmm. Not so much anymore. It kind of seems like that peak in February, it's kind of gone away with a tiny lift in the month of June, but even that is rolling over, Caroline. Yeah, and those meme stocks too. Not only the SPACs, the IPOs, it's all kind of rolling over. Kriti Gupta, we thank you so much. Apart from bonds, of course. Meanwhile, my next guest calls the DD IPO a disaster. With more on that and what China's crackdown means for well, more tech companies, it is Edith Jung of Race Capital. Edith is a China expert, and we're so glad to have you here because once again, DD feeling the pain, share price, I mean, now at like 11 bucks, well below where the IPO price was, and the question marks surrounding who knew and when. Why was it such a disaster in your mind's eye? Oh, it's such a disaster because there's a lot of uh, rumor speculation that um, maybe the founder and, and CEO both know about um, the requests and the change and make sure that they need to comply with the data security and compliance before they go public. Uh, regardless, there's a lot, there's class, a lot uh, action lawsuit going on now and mm. there's a lot of hatreds uh, for the founders and also for the for the president, and it's just really unfortunate to see what's going on. Um, which, in in my mind, I think, you know, no company has sent a really chilling effect for many many Chinese companies that with the goal to get listed in um, in the U.S. Um, recently, including companies like Keep 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 and Himalayas. Uh, originally wanted to go IPO in the U.S. I heard that both call it off because of what's going on with DD. Yeah, LinkDoc as well, postponing its IPO. The ramifications there. That, that, but the, is this to your mind's eye, Edith, what China wants? Does it want to prevent, make it harder, more difficult for companies to go to the capital source that is the United States? I think, you know, what's really, really interesting to me is that in the past, a lot of people say data is the new oil. Data now really is the most important things in terms of infrastructure. Um, I think China, the most, some of the most important internet company of China, including Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent Music, are all listed um, in the U.S. There's over 248 companies from China is listed in the U.S. U.S. stock market is really, really important uh, to China and Chinese company. But having said that, um, the new data security law, which just passed, uh, June 11th is something that Chinese government really cared about and no one is going to get past this doesn't really matter how big you are um, of, of internet companies. So from your perspective, 
it is the data issue that it's at stake here. The data is the issue for the Chinese government. Do you think that anything can be done to ease that out? Or do you think really from here on out, if you're a big company being built in China, there is going to be some sort of partition, some wall, east versus west, and, and you're going to be listing in Hong Kong instead? Yeah, definitely. I think more and more Chinese companies, because what's going on, uh, what happened to end, uh, end grouped, and also now with ED, more and more of them because they think about Hong Kong stock market um, instead of going to the U.S. But the key thing is we have seen this happen before um, in the past. You know, with with Tencent, with some of their games that's not necessarily approved by government, they have to take them down for a few days. So this is something I absolutely think that could be fixed, but it is amount of time. It's not going to be fast. Uh, it's something that many Chinese company is learning about the new data security law. Um, I think for the rest of the year, it will be very, very tough for Chinese companies to go public in the U.S. What are you thinking about as an investor? What are VCs, uh, investors out there thinking about the opportunities in, of China exposure now? Do they want exposure to China when there's such regulatory risk? And if they do, how do they get it? I think what is was really interesting, and this is not just for VC, but also for many U.S. investors, now, more and more, we even though it seems like it's getting more and more difficult for Chinese companies to get listed here, but it's not really stopping U.S. venture capital or U.S. investor to invest in China or invest in Hong Kong stock market. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, I think flexibility to investor are actually a lot more so than Chinese company coming over. Um, so in this sense, it's not necessarily a bad thing uh, for investor per se, but we definitely are taking precaution and advise our private companies to think twice where they want to exit or where they want to get listed. And when you say to think twice, like what, what would you advise those companies, those portfolio companies, small companies that are wanting to be, you know, build global businesses here? What do you say? Well, I think think twice means there are a lot of particular compliance and data security law they will have to comply. I think rushing to, and if you are getting any government warning to do mm. certain things, mm. um, definitely don't rush to get listed because government can definitely take down any, your app anytime that you, they want. So in that sense, um, is not only about exit, it's really about after going public, there's a lot more responsibility um, that you, as a public company that you really need to be responsible for. Um, so not necessarily think twice about where to list, but really about making sure that you are compliance regardless where you're going to go public. Some hard lessons being learned at the moment. Edith Young, so interesting. Thank you. Come back, race capital, of course, from there, her expertise. Meantime, Facebook CEO appears not to be concerned about the lawsuit brought against the social network by former President Donald Trump. Walking past the cameras at the Allen & Co conference in Sun Valley, Idaho, Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg declined to comment on the legal action. Trump has filed three separate class action lawsuits against Facebook, Twitter, Google and its CEOs over banning his accounts on their platform. Coming up, going full circle, we speak with Circle CEO Jeremy Allaire and Concord Chairman Bob Diamond on the stablecoin issuer's $4.5 billion SPAC deal, what it means for the future of cryptocurrencies. This is Bloomberg. Circle, you know it is the issuer of the stable coin, USDC, is set to go public in a merger with the SPAC company Concord with a value of $4.5 billion after the firm, of course, recently raised a $440 million funding round from investors. Joining us now is Concord Chairman Bob Diamond, Circle CEO Jeremy Allaire, and Bloomberg Shanali Basak, who we thank for helping bring this interview about. Jeremy, a while ago, we sat down in Boston at the start of the journey and talk to us about why you want to go public right now. Well, you know, um, we've just seen incredible growth in, in USDC and, and in the products and services that we've been able to build around it. Last year, USDC grew from 400 million in circulation to 4 billion in circulation. And really, since January 1st, it's grown to almost 26 billion USDC in circulation, just representing incredible growth. As we thought about the opportunity, we thought about the growing role 
of dollar digital currencies in the future of payment systems, in the future of financial market infrastructure. We saw an enormous opportunity to, uh, you know, both raise capital, but also more importantly, build a significant public company with transparency and visibility to the enterprises and financial institutions that are building on top of us. Bob, you know, there are a lot of your peers on Wall Street who don't believe in DeFi and don't believe in uh, digital currencies for that matter. So what do you believe, clearly you do, right, and given that you are buying uh, this asset <laughs> through, through a SPAC deal of your own exactly. and you spend so much of your time on this at your own private equity firm, what might traditional finance players be missing? So I think the, the opportunity here, um, I mean, it's right down the middle of what we we're thinking about when we issued our SPAC in December of 2020. Uh, it is stablecoin. It is digital currency. It is blockchain, which is secure. Uh, the Internet makes this incredibly instantaneous. Um, so secure, instantaneous. Um, and it's all about payments, and it's all about treasury and transaction services. And I think that's the thought that Jeremy had from the beginning, is how does he position this platform uh, so that it can, it can be, um, uh, you know, a leader in just that, in U.S. dollar payments and transaction and treasury services. And that's what gets us so excited. I'm looking at your presentation, the investor presentation, and, Jeremy, a global payments market that is currently at $35 trillion. Long-term addressable markets, you say, of that $35 trillion and $130 trillion M2 money supply, of course. How much do you really think something like your stable coin or indeed crypto in general will take of that addressable market? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's kind of like asking the question, you know, in the early 90s of, you know, how much content would be delivered through the Internet and web browsers versus physical print medium or broadcast television or asking, you know, how much text and voice communication is going to happen over traditional telephone companies versus free Internet services. I think that the power of digital currency models, in particular, these full reserve you know, stablecoin, dollar digital currency models is, is extraordinary. It is bringing the powers of the Internet to, in this particular case, the most important reserve currency in the world and giving it tremendous uh, capabilities. And so we believe over time the benefits of operating in a, in a full reserve digital currency model are going to be superior to M2 commercial bank electronic money. And so I don't know exactly what percentage of that market uh, will be filled by this and over exactly what time frame. Obviously, we have a kind of midterm view in, in, in terms of how we think USDC can grow. But clearly, the opportunity is in addressing these very significant multi-trillion dollar markets. Jeremy, I'm really curious about the competitive landscape, how you feel about Tether and maybe closing the gap in terms of a rivalry there. You know, um, just in general, I don't really focus on, on competition per se. When we started working on USDC four years ago, we had a vision for building an open standard, building something that operated within the regulatory perimeter of the United States, within the two-tier banking system, with solid controls, compliance, and with accountability, both to banking supervisors uh, as well as consumer protection laws. Uh, we've built something that has a lot of traction in the broader digital asset ecosystem, and we've been growing our market share very, very considerably. I think the important thing is when you think about, you know, what is going to be a foundational technology for the future of dollar payments on the Internet? What are financial market participants, large Internet firms, financial technology firms going to build on and utilize? Uh, we, we think, you know, something that is, you know, operating within the regulatory perimeter of the United States and operating in this manner uh, is likely to be what the industry builds around. So interesting. The other point you make to investors is that USDC is not displacing existing central bank money. So, Bob, you've run a global bank before. How important is it that you think that uh, the U.S. needs to get their hands around digital assets before China does? I think we separate, you know, just crypto or digital currencies in a couple of ways. But I think the one that was most important to me uh, as we began talking about this this merger with Germany is, you know, the difference between USDC and stablecoins. 
relative to some of the more speculative Bitcoin type cryptocurrencies. Taking Bitcoin as an example, less than 1% uh, of Bitcoin is used for transactions. Uh, if you look at the growth of uh, USDC, uh, from the time we began talking in January of around 6 billion to 25 billion or maybe over 25 billion today, and the fact that there's been over uh, just short of a trillion dollars in transactions that are executed using USDC, that explains everything. It's mm -hmm. about payments, uh, it's about treasury and transaction services, um, and that's the platform that Jeremy has been building. But Jeremy, what, I mean, Bob, actually, I want to direct it to you first. What about a, a Fed coin? What if the central bank of the United States does get in on the act? What does that mean for quote unquote sure. competitors? Yeah, I mean, m m you know, we we have a lot of thoughts on this. And, you know, first and foremost, you know, we believe that as these technologies grow, become internet scale technologies that can be accessed by, you know, on the open internet, the same way that we can use Skype as we are now to freely, uh, you know, c communicate. Um, as these open internet technologies grow, um, it's going to be increasingly important that, you know, the federal government or other national governments are, are working closely with, uh, industry on the right forms of regulatory supervision, the right forms of rules uh, th that are needed. And, and obviously, we're very focused on that and have been since we really founded the company eight years ago. I think very specifically in terms of, you know, central bank digital currency, we've been very clear in, in our view, which is that the history of electronic money innovation, not only in the United States, but in most of the world, is a history of private sector actors uh, working in consortiums and networks to build technology standards, interoperable standards. And that's what's given us the international correspondent banking system. That's what's given us the card networks. That's what's given us Apple Pay, PayPal, and other innovations. Digital currency innovation on the public internet is very similar. It's, it's following the arc of the internet as opposed to these you know, legacy technologies. And I think that open access, open market model is what the United States needs. And I don't think the, the strategy for the United States should be to try to out China China. I think the strategy for the United States should be to embrace the open internet and private sector innovation. And I'm, I'm fairly confident that over the next two or three years, that's gonna grow significantly uh, in, in adoption, not just in the US, but around the world. Jeremy, just on transparency and on what's backing your stable coin, where you're investing your assets, some people are saying they'd like to see even more transparency tether's been forced into that are you as of now a public company how are you thinking of talking about what what you're putting your money in the approved investments that you currently put your money in yeah it's a it's a great question and actually uh you know this morning in in other public communications as, as we talk about this we view the process of you know circle as the uh, principal operator of USDC becoming a public company is creating a tremendous opportunity for greater public disclosure. Obviously, public disclosure to the SEC, public disclosure to the entire marketplace. And so our intention is in our public filings, uh, you know, we, our first public filings uh, associated with this transaction, Form S4, uh, we intend to include more details about the full reserve nature of USDC, uh, how, how that is managed. Uh, and provide the transparency that the market is looking for. There's this perception that Bitcoin is gold. And there's a question of how soon it will be for Ethereum to catch up. When it comes to Bitcoin, there's a lot of friction where, when it comes to payments, but there's a lot of adoption when it comes to Ethereum and applications built on it. Uh, do you guys believe that Ethereum is a better model when it comes to payments, when it comes to uh, just the way you use it <laughs> when it comes to applications. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the thing about, about digital assets is that there, there's an incredible diversity here and it's very easy to kind of lump everything together. You know, Bitcoin is designed as a, uh, you know, a, as a non-sovereign store of value, that's that's really where the community has has focused, and and I think where a lot of its traction ha has been largely. Ethereum is a more general-purpose platform for building a wide range of decentralized applications, and blockchains themselves are almost like a new operating system layer for the internet, and there are many competing 
blockchain platforms, Ethereum obviously being the one that has the most developers, the most applications on it. But you know, one of the things that's notable about, about what we've done with USDC is USDC is a protocol that operates on now five different public blockchain networks, and we're committed to bringing it to more. And so there's a lot of competition in the fundamental infrastructure for these important fiduciary trust applications, decentralized applications that can be built on this. Uh, it, 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 and it, it's not a winner takes all right now. Uh, and and we're, we're just frankly excited to see how much innovation there is taking place with infrastructure that can you know, ultimately scale, we think, to millions of transactions per second and provide a foundation for not just consumer scale payments, but fundamentally the core market infrastructure of the capital markets as well. Big conversations. Sonali from... Mm, you go, Bob. Sonali, I was just going to say, in, in addition, the, the beauty of, of operating uh, on blockchain is, is Jeremy has built this business and on multiple blockchain platforms is it allows, it allows the middleman, the person in the middle charging the fees to be removed, the security and the speed um, and the confidence that, that uh, we all have in blockchain uh, allows that. And uh, being on multiple blockchains is a key part of the, uh, of the strategy here. Bob Diamond, I'm pleased to say, I think you're going to be joining us a little bit next week as well. So more thoughts coming from you of Concord and Circle CEO Jeremy Allaire. Congratulations on going public, Shanali Basak. We want to thank you so much for joining us today. Meanwhile, coming up, China gets a cheaper version of Tesla's locally made EVs. We'll have the details next. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back. Let's take a look at some of the other stories we are following in China. Tesla has unveiled a significantly cheaper version of its locally built Model Y SUV. That's after a string of negative publicity may have hurt consumer sentiment towards the electric car making pioneer. The so-called standard range Model Y starts a little more than 42,000. That's about 20% less than the original longer range Model Y. NBC plans to use the upcoming Summer Olympics to supercharge its streaming service, Peacock. NBC launched Peacock a year ago and hoped to leverage the spotlight of the games to drive sign-ups. But the pandemic postponed the event for a year. Now, Comcast is hunting for ways for Peacock to stand out in a fiercely competitive field. Now, coming up, are you making a career out of TikTok? Or is TikTok influencing a new career in it of itself? Why younger demographic is turning to the social platform, not only for, well, dance advice, but investment advice as well that's next plus some stock picking to fruit picking we meet the chinese farmers using social media live streaming that's TikTok too to sell their produce to urban consumers we could dig into both of those viral stories meanwhile stocks down on the day big tech takes a hit this is bloomberg <laughs> This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm, at, of course, Caroline Hyde in for Emily Chang. I'm right now in New York. Meanwhile, Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta is here in New York with me as well to take us through well, some of the big movers on the day. Absolutely, Caroline. Widespread selling in big tech was no exception. Usually, that's where you tend to see that safe haven trade. But for the most part, those record highs did not last today. You saw it. Facebook, Microsoft, Apple, all down. Amazon really the sole exception, which is interesting because it wasn't actually trading in line with the rest of those big tech stocks. I really want to go and show you what that's doing to those FANG stocks broadly because as we compare it to the FANG, New York FANG index in particular, which accounts for some of those Chinese ADRs as well, you have American big tech tech reaching those record highs, but the Chinese ADRs, the likes of Didi and Alibaba and all that kind of risk off sentiment dealing with that part of the world, those are kind of holding the New York Stock Exchange uh, bank index, I should say, back just a little bit. And that's really what this chart is showing, that divergence is really going to be crucial. And as we're talking about risk sentiment, Caroline, we have to talk about Bitcoin because mm -hmm. that is turning into this macro risk sentiment indicator. And so far, it hasn't been doing so well year to date. And really, you're starting to see this decline, starting to really edge lower, even those kind of days that they, Bitcoin is having a good day 
still not that great in the grand scheme of things. So much for the diversification trade. Hey, Kriti, it's a, <laughs> overall a risk asset, it would seem, Kriti Gupta there. Meanwhile, let's turn to, well, the world of TikTok. Now that the regulatory tension around TikTok has cooled, there is one certainty, and that is content creators on the platform are turning short-form videos into a seriously lucrative business. Now, this is quite literally and figuratively speaking as well, because while content creators are making money on the platform, there is a significant audience turning to the social media to get tips and tricks on how to navigate the stock market, how to invest their money. There's even a term for it, FinTop. One of our influencers impacting the space, Kayla Kilbride is with us, who joins us now, who not only is across TikTok, but you also have a presence on Twitter where you're known as Robin Hood Kid. And mm -hmm. Kayla, talk to us about, well, why TikTok's such a great communicator for the world of finance, do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, going back, a lot of people would say people in my generation have a short attention span. So when you're <laughs> learning and educating and whatnot, sitting through, you know, long form studies or whatever it might be is just a little too much. So to have something in 60 seconds or less um, and to be able to explain those concepts um, that fast, people are really inclined to and, and will take 60 seconds out of their day to learn something new. We want to learn something, um, but it's just do we want to spend, uh, you know, three hours in a lecture hall doing it <laughs> if we can do it in 60 seconds on TikTok? <laughs> I know, and you sort of have said how you can go from taking a one-hour presentation on economics and markets <laughs> to make it a 60-second one. But what about your background? Why did you get into it? Why did you get into the world of finance? Yeah, so I actually studied sociology in college. Um, I had a focus on the wealth and inequality gap in a lot of different realms. Um, but post-grad, I ended up um, basically just trying out a few different things and not really loving anything that I was doing. And my dad, who's in finance, was like, you know, I have an improv background. He's like, you could, you could really keep people entertained just like explaining basic concepts on TikTok or YouTube. So I was like, okay, and he does this on YouTube. So I was like, you know what? If my dad is doing it, I'm just going <laughs> to go for it because I can't have my dad one up me. So I was like, I'm going to go for it and uh, jumped on TikTok and it's fun. It was just a creative expression for me to basically describe what I was already learning about the stock market. So it's not like I was teaching. It was more like I was publicly learning in mm. creative new ways. And it just seemed that there were, you know, a lot of young people who resonated where they're like, wow, no one has ever even attempted to explain finance concepts to mm. me like this. So but, it was fun. But you're saying basic concepts, but trading options isn't basic. You help make it basic. But there must be, Kayla, a level of well, responsibility that you feel because there is concern that people are going out there, climbing on the GameStop bandwagon, AMC, perhaps sometimes losing money, perhaps getting themselves in a hole they didn't realize through trading options. How do you feel about that when you're educating and ensuring people are being wise with their money as well? I mean, I wouldn't even go that far to say with my page that you know we're even at that place. You have an entire generation of people who have never even had a conversation about their finances. Maybe people have never taught them how to budget or don't even know what the stock market is in general or where to start. Most of the comments on my pages are like, investing, where do I do that? Do I have to call a guy? You know, and so it's <laughs> that conversation down the road, you know, people aren't necessarily, the people that I'm talking to aren't fiddling with options quite yet. But to say like, hey, actually, this thing that people have made sound really, really complicated, let's at least just get you feeling comfortable in the conversation. And then down the line, which I do host Zoom calls or things like that with people who can ask deeper questions, like this actually sounds really risky and you made it sound really simple. I'm like, yes, absolutely. Let's get you into the conversation. Let's have this conversation about your finances and, and we can go deeper. And you can't necessarily do that in 60 seconds for all the complex topics, specifically with options or trading or day trading or whatever it might be. But welcoming people into the conversation is a different story for sure. And you said, it's notable you said that, do I have to call a guy? Now, <laughs> of course, statistics are that most people in finance are male, right? And I'm of interested course. in your audience. Who, who is coming to you for advice? Yeah, it seems to be a lot of the, the people that I've interacted with on Zoom calls are typically uh, ages 17 to 25 year old women. Um, and occasionally I have, you know, maybe a millennial female, but 74% of my audience is female. Um, so I have, yeah, 73 point something percent female with 132,000 followers. So um, specifically on TikTok, Twitter is a little different, but Twitter is also a male dominated space, so. P personal question a bit, but like, of course, we talk a lot about meme investing and Look, to be perfectly frank, I hear a load of condescension 
often being voiced. People saying, oh, there's retail investors, that Wall Street bets. What do you make of that sort of a feel? Like your dad might feel it to a certain extent. He's talking to people on, on YouTube, as you're saying. Yeah, so the, the, you're asking just how I feel about meme stocks in general and kind of our Yeah, generation. and the sentiment around it and perhaps older institutional money and the way that feel about the, the upcoming yeah. uprising of the retail trader. I think it's just the perfect storm. It's a storyline where it's like a lot of young people are getting in into the markets and they're learning new things. And then all of a sudden we're doing something different with the market. Like that's kind of a big deal. So I, I personally don't trade meme stocks. They're obviously highly volatile. They scare the crap out of me, but that's okay. So I avoid them. But I think um, any at this point, it seems like it's catching. I actually have a hat right here based on because I like the stock. It's a <laughs> like the whatever the GameStop one. But um, yeah, I love the storyline. I think it's it opens the door for a lot of people my age. So I have I have nothing against it. I just I personally think it's kind of scary. I'm not a skilled trader um, when it comes to you know trading those sorts of those sorts of things. So uh, but I like the storyline. It's kind of fun. <laughs> and are you? investing in the market dare I ask like you said you were trying to find where your role was within the world in terms of a profession this is your profession are you making your money from your social media activity are you making it from the investments that you're making on the market I am actually losing money in the market right now <laughs> a few so, are. Uh, <laughs> um, I trade actually with uh, tasty trade and they do like the options trading so they're teaching me a lot um, when it comes to familiarizing myself with the market, becoming comfortable with both upward moves and downward moves. And so I'm I'm understanding things like volatility and options. And and that's been a huge gift um, to, to have kind of the pressure taken off of the learning experience. Um, but I also do investing on my own when it comes to just more long-term investing. So I do trade options on the daily or weekly, but for the most part, my goal is retirement. So putting money towards that just more consistently and not being too afraid of of starting somewhere. Um, but yeah, most of the the money necessarily that I make on TikTok is, um, isn't from my actual trades as much as it is just understanding how the concepts work, so. I would say, well, we're pretty passionate here about financial inclusion, about financial literacy. And well, it's interesting to see that that <laughs> financial inclusion narrative is going across all sorts of platforms and certainly happening yeah. in TikTok. Content creator Caleb Kilbride, yeah. thank you so much <laughs> for joining. Come do it again sometime. Really fun. Meanwhile, sticking with social media, platforms like TikTok aren't just creating internet sensations in the fields of finance, fashion or food. In China, it's also including farming. Some farmers are turning to online streaming services to show off their produce to urban consumers. Now, Bloomberg's Quick Takes Selena Shu reports on this lucrative trend. Yunnan-based farmer Jing Guowei is part of the growing trend of rural entrepreneurship in China. Farmers and agricultural vendors in far-flung provinces now sell their goods directly to urban consumers through interactive live streams and bite-sized videos on platforms like Douyin, TikTok's Chinese twin. 短视频和直播对销售农产品的优势，我认为是最重要的是直观性吧，就是观众可以一面看到这个销售员，一面在讲解这个水果啊，当时你一面可以看到这个场景。你看，比如说我现在我的这些水果，看到没有？嗯，当
More than 100,000 farmers broadcast 2.52 million sessions from March 2020 to 2021. Coming up, Zeus Health recently raised $34 million to build on the future of health tech. CEO Jonathan Bush joins us next. This is Bloomberg. Now, as the healthcare industry continues to grow, Zeus Health has taken the initiative to work up a, well, a new health data reality. The company has recently raised $34 million to take its health tech company to the next level. Joining us now to discuss the future of health tech, Zeus Health CEO, Jonathan Bush. And Jonathan, congratulations on the funding round. And of course, it was sort of launched back in June 2021, is Zeus Health. Talk to us where, where you're wanting to take it. It's about building a data set that then other startups can build on top of, right? Yeah, I think that's that's about right, Caroline. Thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, Zeus wants to be a platform company. So we've built a national master person index for every American and uh, a data store that can hold a record, medical and otherwise, for every American. And then entrepreneurs who want to build software, we've built a kind of a Build-A-Bear studio, a, a set of tools that you can use to build apps and other software uh, to provide care. What's exciting in healthcare in the US of late, spurned in part by, spurred on in part by COVID is this idea uh, of getting technology into the direct delivery of care. So we saw, I think it was $15 billion go into venture back startups delivering actual care with technology during 2020, another 8 billion just in the first quarter a uh, really big explosion in the number uh, of companies trying to enter into delivery with more scalable, more virtual, more digital products. And all of them have a lot of stuff to build. Mm. So if they could work off of a common tool set for the more common assets, everybody's got to write a prescription writer. Well, why don't we just all use a common one? Everybody yeah. needs to order labs. Everybody needs an app to talk to patients and text with care providers. I mean, all of these things are utilities that you'll be able to get and build on in the Zeus uh, Builder Studio. That you've built before, in fact. I mean, of course, you're a co-founder of Athena Health. I use that yeah. as my, my way of communicating for my medical records and those of my children and with my doctor. But and why, what is the security element to all of this? Because immediately I'm seeing that my data is being dug into. How do you ensure that that's number one priority? Yeah, anytime anybody delegates anything to anyone else, they expect at least as high or more sort of fiduciary duty, right? So if you have somebody, one guy lends, let you look at your record, you need a certain amount of fiduciary duty. If a million, when I left Athena, I think there were 130 million records in the Athena net uh, database. So the premium on protecting those records was high. Uh, and if Zeus gets to that scale, uh, in its unique uh, approach to dealing with a different audience, being a sales to doctors and hospitals, and we're selling to these, these startups, uh, will need to be as secure uh, or more. What do you think is the most ripe area for disruption at the moment? N not only to unify all the health data, that's a Herculean task. It's not something that's easily done in a you know, a government-backed health care system in the UK, let alone a private divided one yeah. that you see in the US. But what do you want to see fixed by some of the startups that you're going to be able to, you know, steer and thrive? I think the office visit is the most ripe for disruption by far. The idea of taking a half a day off of work and then getting this clipboard as if they've never seen you before, and then you <laughs> take off your knickers in the, on the wax paper there, and all to really, the net of it is to talk for three minutes with a doctor or six. Uh, the fact that you could just text <laughs> and have many, many more interactions at a much lower price point. Uh, Isn't that already happening? Like an obvious trade, right? You just, of course. Do you not feel that that's already happening to a large extent? How, oh, how good is telemedicine already, do you think? 
oh, it's in its infancy. Obviously, we had a wonderful boost. Everybody got a trial of telemedicine during COVID because that was the only way to see a doctor. Uh, and we all liked it. You know, it was all, uh, 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 it did well. Uh, the, the spend in the United States, you know, you've got the things you think of with healthcare, big infectious diseases, traumatic injuries. And in the U.S., our healthcare system for those things is extraordinary. But we don't actually spend very much money on that as a percentage of the total. 80% of what we spend is on behaviorally driven conditions. Diabetes and hypertension, you hear this a thousand times. Those things, there is no procedure or pill uh, that solves those problems. They need coaching and tweaking and lots of nurturing over time. Mm -hmm. So care needs to move to, to the edge computing scenario where there's lots and lots of very low cost touches. And most of the companies I'm seeing do well and that I'm involved with are out there building really impressive ways of touching a lot of times patients uh, against a given condition, weight loss, diabetes, alcohol conditions, primary care, even cancers. Uh, that's what's exciting to me and where I think the first wave of disruption. There'll be other waves after that, but that's what's happening right now. We'll see how that continues to be built on that platform that you're building. 34 million just recently in the door to go out and build it. Thanks to Andreessen and Horowitz and many other investors. Zeus Health CEO and founder Jonathan Bush. Great to have some time with you. Thank you. Meanwhile, coming up, Instacart has announced a former Facebook exec will take over as CEO. We'll discuss the leadership shakeup at the San Francisco startup. That's next. Meanwhile, gains for Etsy, Overstock, and Real Real. All three have been added to Needham's coverage and rated buys. Analyst, analyst over there, Anna Andreeva, saying that 27% sales growth for the group, along with ThreadUp and Chewy, in the next two years. Clothing resellers are expected to see the strongest consumer demand. Mr. Bloomberg. So Jeff Bezos taking a little break from his space flight preparations with a quick trip to Sun Valley, Idaho. Now the world's richest man arrived at the Allen & Co. conference alongside his girlfriend, that's Lauren Sanchez. Bezos officially stepped down as Amazon CEO earlier this week, allowing former AWS boss at Sandy Jassy to take the reins. Bezos, next stop, you know it, the edge of space. When he blasts off aboard his Blue Origin spacecraft on July 20th. But not before fellow billionaire Richard Branson takes his space flight of his own. Make sure you tune in this Sunday when you're not watching the soccer to this live and special coverage of the Virgin Galactic launch starting 9 a.m. Wall Street time, 6 a.m. on the West Coast. Meanwhile, Instacart has announced that Fiji Simo will take over as the company's CEO as the online grocery shopping platform prepares to go public later this year. Now, she replaces the founder of Purva Meta, who becomes executive chairman. She also leaves behind a title of having been the head of Facebook's social networking app. Now, Tom Allison is Facebook product and engineering executive who has been with the company for 11 years. He will take over as the new head of the social networking app. Joining us now, Bloomberg Kurt Wagner, who covers all things Facebook, helped write this story. Kurt, first and foremost, was it a surprise that she was leaving? Was Facebook taken by surprise? I think it was a surprise in the sense that she seemed to be well-liked. I mean, she has a very important job at Facebook, right? She's running the main social network, uh, and she's only been in that job for about two years. So in that sense, it, it is a little surprising. On the other hand, uh, Simo is really known internally as someone who's uh, climbing the ladder. You know, she's really – she's been there a decade. She's had all kinds of important jobs inside Facebook, always been very ambitious. And she had kind of reached the end of the road there because the – only person really ahead of her at product, there's two people, Chris Cox and Mark Zuckerberg, and they're not going anywhere. So I think, you know, if she wanted to take another step and, and actually lead a company, which I believe was her ambition, it was going to have to be somewhere else. What about, therefore, who takes over the app and, and the focus? Any, any reorientation, you think, in terms of focus for the business? Well, it's always interesting with uh, the core Facebook social network because it feels like Mark Zuckerberg has a little bit more of a hands-on approach there than some of the other products like a, a WhatsApp or Instagram, right? This is the thing he created. It's the thing that he still very much cares about. He cares about the success. So oftentimes the person in charge kind of feels like, um, you know, more of the day-to-day -day person, not necessarily the big picture. But at the same time, you know, this is a huge job. This is a platform that reaches more than 2 billion people. It's, it's the largest social network in the world. So anyone who's in charge there is going to have a, a lot of stuff to do. 
but I think their plan is pretty well established at this point, especially around creators and video and stuff like that. So I don't mm -hmm. anticipate a huge strategy change here, but it'll be interesting to see, you know, whether uh, Tom Allison can kind of have the same leadership uh, that Fiji did and, and whether or not he'll be kind of accepted by everyone who works there in the same way. Now, Kurt, I just want to go back to a graphic that we were just showing of who now is in the leadership positions at Facebook, because to be perfectly frank, it's not a good look because we're in an age where we're talking about diversity, when we're talking about people of color, when we're talking about women, and, and many who have been previously left behind in terms of top ranks. And right now I see a, well, a non-diverse group. Is that something Facebook's thinking about? Well, it's not just something that we in the industry are talking about. It's something that Facebook talks about all the time, mm. right? They, they set a lot of public goals around diversity, especially around uh, women in leadership and, and women in engineering. And, yeah, as you point out, uh, there's a lot of men on that board. And Fiji was the highest-ranking woman in product, which is a huge deal at Facebook. Product is really what runs the show there. So the fact that she's gone and, and now everyone in charge of all their divisions is, is a man and most of them white men, I just think that's a bad look for a company that claims that this is really important. And it's certainly a bad look for the product yeah. because this is, a, again, a product that touches billions of people. It needs a diverse leadership group. Kurt Wagner, we thank you so much for that story of Instacart and Facebook. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Make sure you tune in tomorrow when we'll be joined by Visa CFO. This is Bloomberg.